Hello everyone. Welcome to Reason with Science. I'm your host Chitendra. This episode is with Lars Chitka. He is a professor at Queen Mary University of London. Lars is an expert on the behavior, cognition and ecology of bees and their interaction with flowers. His latest book is The Mind of a Bee, where he explores the vast amount of work done on the bee behavior. In this conversation, we talk about structure of bee colonies, nature nurture, cognition, intelligence and consciousness. Enjoy the conversation, share and subscribe to support the podcast. Thank you for listening. Hi Lars, welcome to the podcast. Hi there, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. So, um you've been working on bees more than 3 decades now. Uh what is like the most exciting or most alien thing you thing uh, that you think about bees? Well, that's a big question. Um I think just how much intelligence you can squeeze into how tiny a brain is the big overarching exciting thing. Um in terms of the alienness then of course it is fantastic just how differently bees perceive the world in every sensory modality they see colors differently from us they see polarized light which we don't it appears they have a magnetic magnetic sensitivity so a sensitivity to the earth's magnetic field and so on they can even sense electric fields so everything about them is about their sensory world is very alien to us or their intelligent behavior is remarkable in that it's being generated by so tiny a brain yeah certainly these are like really mind boggling uh phenotypes as we as we can say uh in biology so if we i mean so first of all i really liked your book the mind of a bee where um, and and especially the way you started with the words of morris uh, metalink uh, do you uh, recall his words not by heart i can grab the book and read them to you if uh... sure sure that will be great all right here we go yeah let us suppose that an inha- inhabitant of venus or mars were to contemplate us from the height of a mountain and watch the little black specks that we form in space as we come and go in the streets and squares of our towns all he could do like ourselves when we gaze at the hive would be to take note of some facts that seem very surprising and from these facts to deduce conclusions probably no less erroneous no less uncertain than those that we choose to form concerning the bee whither do they tend and what is it they do he would ask after years and centuries of patient watching what is the aim of their life or its pivot i can see nothing that governs their actions the little things that one day they appear to collect and build up the next day they destroy and scatter they come and they go they meet and disperse but one knows not what it is they seek wow i mean those were like just once i read that paragraph it was like really difficult to put down your book it was so so great after that um and i thought that let's take that analogy like a step further and and think of um not not or not like two humans sitting and having conversation but maybe two bees and uh two bees sitting and having this conversation in front of the computers and and stuff so let's say that your avatar which is this kind of bee lars how how would that avatar uh, would uh perceive the 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 view that you are seeing right now like the computer the screen how how do they uh, perceive the world well that avatar would see very strange colors first of all because the screen does not have an ultraviolet component in its color palette so bees unlike us can see the ultraviolet they can't see red as well as we do but they have a whole segment of electromagnetic radiation that they're sensitive to which we aren't ultraviolet just gives us sunburn but we can't actually see it and so that would be missing for a bee if she were to talk about the screen and she might muse that um there are these strange big animals out there on the planet that can't see the ultraviolet at all and um might um 
think that we humans are very strange because we're lacking that sensory dimension. But is it uh, unique to bees that they can see only the UV spectra or it's also common in other animals? It is actually quite common. We, we are strange in a sense that we do not detect it, but all insects to our knowledge have sensitivity to ultraviolet light, but even many vertebrates. So many species of fish and reptiles and birds sense the ultraviolet. Mammals are special in that the vast majority of them cannot see it. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to discuss, uh, you know, the evolution of these kind of phenotypes. But before that, let's talk a little bit about uh, how a newborn bee would spend its time, like uh, kind of how would it go around to learn around the world uh, using these kind of uh, abilities, as you mentioned. Well, a newborn bee is a very strange life form. It's a tiny grub, first of all, that sits in a very um, uh, privileged environment that is in a pot made of wax and, and stuffed full of food by, by adult bees. So they start their, their lives as, as larvae, as tiny grubs inside the, the um, honeycomb or another wax construction if it's a different species of bee and they don't have to do anything for their food. The food just gets dumped into, the, um, into their little pots and they just have to sit there and eat. Then of course they pupate and emerge as a very different being. The miracle of metamorphosis there is another topic that we could talk about for hours, but from what is initially a sort of legless grub, later on of course a full beautiful flying insect emerges. But the first thing that an adult bee does is not actually to fly, because mostly the beginning of her life is spent inside the hive or inside the nest and dealing with labors that uh, need to be taken off care of inside the, the nest. And it's dark. It's typically dark in a bee's nest. And so all the sensing is done by by olfactory stimuli, by scent. She smells her environment, she tastes it, she feels it, but she doesn't see very much yet. That only kicks in later when she leaves the hive, when she's made the transition from a within hive worker to one that first defends the colony and then leaves the hive to, to visit flowers. And that's when vision comes into play, when they have to see the flowers, many of which reflect ultraviolet, when she has to use her sensitivity to polarized light to navigate, her electric sensitivity to detect the electric fields on flowers and so on. So the relative importance of different senses changes in the course of a bee's life. Yeah, that's interesting. So then does it does it mean that all this happens in the reference of flowers? That just because of, uh, I mean, for example, the evolution of UV, if we talk about, or uh, the, the vision in UV spectra, um, is it related to flowers or it's something more? Many people thought that for a long time, that because bees seemed special in possessing UV receptors, they were actually first discovered in close relatives of the bees, the ants in the 19th century, and the next species that was um, discovered to have ultraviolet sensitivity were the bees, and it stayed there for quite a number of years. And around the same time in the 1920s, it was also discovered that flowers reflect ultraviolet, and it therefore seemed only natural to conclude, aha, there must have been co-evolution between bees and flowers to the extent that both evolved to communicate with each other, because flowers need bees, obviously, to transport pollen between flowers. Um, and that was the textbook story for many decades. But um, later on, for a brief time, I actually endorsed that story when during my PhD, I made some model calculations to find out what is the theoretical optimal system for coding flower colors in a nervous system. 
And I found that it's exactly the system that bees have with a blue receptor, a green receptor, and an ultraviolet receptor, including the fine tuning along the wavelength scale. I thought this optimality can only mean that the bees have evolved to see flowers, basically. But it turned out in later analyses that actually UV sensitivity is much older than flowers, that it predates the evolution of flowers by hundreds of millions of years, and that even the aquatic arthropods that predated modern insects presumably already had this ultraviolet sensitivity. They were still in the water, there were no flowers there. Um, so the ultraviolet sensitivity dates back to the Cambrian and flowers simply evolved to address the pre-existing sensitivity in the bees. The bees already had it at that stage. And is there any correlation between bees' evolution and flowers' evolution? Like, did they appear around, roughly around the same time? Well, some elements of uh, the bees' morphology, yes, they did. So um, bees are, of course, specialist flower visitors. They get all their diet from flowers. And uh, that means nectar, that's a source of carbohydrates. It's, uh, it's an energy drink, so to speak, and pollen. And pollen is the protein source from the flowers. Um, bees have adapted, special adapted structures, for example, for carrying the pollen, for grooming it off their hair and packaging it into little um, blobs of pollen that are carried in some bees on the legs and others on the bees' bellies and so on. So there are different species have different adaptations. But clearly these are structural adaptations to, um, to be excellent at this lifestyle of, of harvesting all your food from flowers. And the flowers likewise have um, evolved signals to talk to, if you wish, to pollinators. And these are the colors, the shapes, also the scents, the odors that they display. But in many cases also, they've made it a bit difficult for bees. So they've evolved structures that are not actually, don't actually make it easy for the bees to get to the rewards, to the nectar. And so these are, if you think of snapdragons, for example, you actually have to force the petals apart to crawl into the flowers. And the flowers do that to essentially restrict access to certain types of pollinators, and to some extent also only individuals that have learned to actually manipulate the flowers in, in the right kind of way, because it requires quite a bit of learning. No bee comes pre-equipped with already knowing all the dozens of flower species that might exist in its environment. So they have to learn it. They have to learn to recognize the most rewarding flowers. They have to perform some simple cost benefit ratio in terms of how much do I have to invest into getting these rewards? And, and moreover, what characterizes these rewards? Which colors, which scents, which patterns? Memorize these and then focus only on those flowers that you can exploit the best. And already this part of the foraging or like searching the uh, reward, uh, rewarding flowers, it's like a huge task. I mean, think, thinking of this new bee, which is actually leaving the nest and literally going miles or kilometers uh, away to find flowers where it can go and just, you know, collect the uh, nectar, as, as you mentioned, the juice. Um, so, so how does it manages, uh, how does it manage to do all the, all these tasks? Yeah. So you're right. First of all, it's not a trivial task at all. I mean, we've talked about Juvenile bees, think of a human, ju juvenile human being. And let's say you, you release, and I'm, this is not actually an, an experiment that I'm proposing, but just imagine you would release a three, four-year-old kid into a wilderness, a, a forest, um, and ask them to sort of venture out for several kilometers and find their way back off their own. You're, they're very, very, very likely to get lost. They might make it a few dozen meters away and still find their way back. But the excursions of a length of which a, a bee 
makes, which, as you say, are often for many kilometers or miles, um, you have to be good at remembering your way. And, um, and bees can do that, and they have to, because if they lose their way, then, of course, they can't live on their own, so it's game over for them. But also all their efforts to collect nectar and pollen are lost for the colony. So there is a strong selection pressure to be good at this job. And in doing so, they have a variety of systems that they all use together. One is to use a sun compass. So they um, remember the, the route, let's say, from a hive to a rewarding flower patch as a destination relative to the sun. And that is not trivial because unlike a magnetic compass, where the needle always points north, with the sun, you can't use it as a compass unless you also know what time of day it is. So your food source, if it's due south, will be directly in the direction of the sun in the middle of the day, if you're on the northern hemisphere, that is. Um, but in the morning, it's 90 degrees to the right of the sun, and in the afternoon, it might be 90 degrees to the left. So to use the sun as a, comp as a compass, you also need to know what time it is. You need an, an inner clock, and bees have that too. Now, the sun's not always visible, and so it might be hidden behind clouds, or it might be just behind the horizon or behind a mountain peak if you're in the mountains. And so then it's gone as a compass cue. What do you do then? And it turns out that bees can also use the, the pattern of polarized light in the sky to reconstruct the position of the sun. And then they've got their compass back, even if the sun's currently not visible. And so the, you might recall from school physics lessons that, that light has wave properties, so it swings in a particular direction, like when you attach a, a rope to a wall and shake the other end of it, then it swings in one particular direction. And we can't see that, but bees can. And it swings in different directions in different parts of the sky. But if you see that pattern, you know where the sun is. And so your, your compass sense is intact. So these are two systems that bees use, but they also, of course, have to memorize where exactly their hive is by re remembering or their nest, by remembering the landmarks around it, the rocks, trees, mountain shapes, and so on, to be able to pinpoint exactly where they're coming from. And also they remember landmarks along the way, prominent trees or other um, forest edges, mountains, uh, that they meet either at the food source or somewhere in between and can then retrace their steps to, um, to find their way back, either back home or back to the flower patch if they want to return later. So these are, the, these are some of the remarkable systems that bees are using for highly successful precision navigation. And how do they manage in the dark in that case? Mostly they don't. Um, so the many bees are typically diurnal and only fly during daytime. Um, there are in tropical habitats, there are some nocturnal bees. And how they find their way is not fully understood. Um, they could, of course, use um, other celestial bodies, stars, the moon, and so on for for navigation and presumably also memories, but it is a very challenging task to find your way in a tropical forest environment, for example, in pitch darkness or well, close to pitch darkness. There'll be some light left, but it is a very impressive ability and we don't yet fully understand how that works. Inside the hive, of course, that's an everyday task, but there they do not use vision. So um, it's in the normal um, bee nest inside, let's say, a tree cavity, or in fact, in a man-made hive, it's pretty dark. And there they're using tactile cues. They feel their way around, but also sense to orient. And uh, how do they use these uh, magnetic and electric compasses? 
So the electric sensitivity is an interesting one because they're actually using um, very fine hairs on their body. And these are not necessarily specialized receptors for electric fields, but they can be used as such very much in the same way as when you might know this um, popular children's birthday party game where you rub some inflated balloons on certain synthetic clothes and then they sort of make your hair stand up if you hold them next to your your head and and so you've got an electric sensitivity there you can actually sense the balloon even with your eyes closed because it sort of lifts your hair a little bit so if you tune into that field then you can actually sense it using your hair and that's pretty much what bees can use with um the hairs that are growing for other purposes on their body there so there are mechanosensory hairs but they're not necessarily always used for sensing electric fields they are sensitive to them because an electric field will all bend them in the same direction and so you can if you pay attention to that then sense the the, the source of the electric field and bees can use that to detect for example how recently a flower has been visited um, because every bee that visits one sort of leaves a little electric footprint because there's some exchange of electrons during the landing and the next bee can then sense ah this flower was just visited minutes ago no, no point in going back there because there won't be any nectar magnetic sensitivity is a big question mark if you find that uh, the mechanism there might be a Nobel prize in that we don't know yet. We don't know this for bees or with any certainty for other animals either. There are certain hints that they might use certain otherwise photosensitive molecules for magnetoreception, but there are big controversies and people get very passionate about their pet theories, but there's no decisive proof yet how it's actually done in any animal. Yeah, in the case of uh, this European robins, they are talking about something like uh, quantum effects that they uh, use to navigate. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, yeah, those studies, they, they are, I think, at the organism level that it's like some indirect clues. It's not like they have, it's not like the, the kind of proof they have for, for the uh, vision for, uh, you know, also the mechanism that you describe uh, about the rhodopsins, that there are these receptors that they interact with the light and how that vision is affected. Those those kind of mechanisms are not known yet. Indeed. But uh, it was exciting for me because last week I was watching a documentary uh, on, um, on uh, Maxwell. And uh -huh. then I was reading about this electromagnetic effects in... Uh, in bees and I was like, yeah, he would have been really happy to know that we are studying these effects in organisms. Yeah. Which is exciting. Mm -hmm. So so here now what we are discussing is that the, that a bee, which again, uh, from, from a hive, from its nest, it is going to a completely another location and it, it is able to uh, find out um, its way through using sun as compass or using polarized light or both. Um, and then, of course, it requires something else, which we call cognitive map, or th this this is how we, we remember it, or, or like, how do you describe that landmark uh, representation in the brain of the, of the bees? There are various possible representations, and only one of them is an actual cognitive map. So cognitive map is already a, a relatively advanced form, which very much like a, a physical map that you can spread out in a table, allows you to do a number of clever things, such as, for example, traveling novel shortcuts. So let's say you have a familiarity with two routes from your home, one which takes you, um, I don't know, to your university, and it takes you three kilometers west, and um, another one takes you, let's say, to a conference venue, which is three kilometers north. And you know both these routes, so you can travel them. Uh, they're familiar to you. But now let's say you're at the university and you're asked to travel directly to the conference center. Right. So then you have to think 
mentally, you have to figure out, okay, this is not a route I've traveled before. Can I somehow use my, my familiar routes to generate the geometry for a novel route between the university and the conference center, even if I've never traveled there before? That's what a cognitive map allows you. And it still remains a little controversial whether bees have such a map. Some um, scholars like Randolph Menzel, for example, is strongly in favor and, and says that he has evidence uh, supporting that idea. Others still think that there is not strong enough evidence for such novel shortcutting, for example, because it's often with flying insects and the, the fact that they can, of course, they have lots of time to explore their environment. It's not actually always certain whether they've really never traveled that route between the conference center and your university. They might have been there before, you just haven't spotted it. And so that's a, a potential um, criticism there, but um, it's not, let's say, entirely implausible that they have such a cognitive map, but we're still not certain. What they can certainly do is remember routes and landmarks along these routes. So the first step of my little challenge there, let's say to find their way from your home to the university or your home to the conference center, they could also do that just using familiar landmarks as well as memories of flight vectors, that is fly three kilometers west, for example. Yeah, so they, then how do they, um, so for example, when, when I think of landmarks, it's uh, in, at least in my brain, it's like certain objects, it can be certain trees or some, some sort of combination of, uh, um, I would say different colors that they can see on the ground, but what sort of landmarks uh, they can use to identify certain places? Well, I mean, it's not entirely different from us. If there are uniquely identifiable landmarks, let's say you as a tourist in Paris from anywhere, you can see the, the Eiffel Tower. And so that's a useful landmark. So whatever is conspicuous and unique and memorable is useful. Things that, um, that are highly indistinguishable from others. So let's say lots of pine trees with similar shapes, of course, are less useful because there you might confuse one for the other. So anything that stands out um, from other surrounding landmarks that identifies a specific location is more useful than something that occurs in lots of similar forms. And the other important thing is, so in the case of bees, which are uh, considered as social animals, um, first of all, is it true? Are they social? Many of them are, but not all. So that's a good question. The vast majority of people probably associate with the term bee, the familiar honeybee, and they are highly social with uh, colonies of, let's say 60,000 workers and one queen. Um, other bees that are also at least familiar to most people, like bumblebees, are also social, although they form much smaller colonies. But the vast majority of bee species are actually solitary. So there are tens of thousands of species of bees that, um, that have no social lifestyle at all, that largely live as single mothers, so to speak. It's invariably the mothers that build the nest and they will have a, a much smaller clutch of brood that they provision and, and, um, and feed and defend and um, build a protective structure for, but then that's it. So at the, at the end of the summer, that um, adult individual will die and the bees will, the, the offspring will overwinter in a tiny nest and typically hatch the next spring. So there are many, many species of bees that have this solitary lifestyle, but others are, are highly social. And you're right, in the case of honeybees, in addition to individual exploration and learning the path to food patches or flowering trees or um, any, any rewarding food source, 
they can also communicate about the coordinates of such food sources. And this is a really remarkable communication system because it's called the dance language and it actually has elements of a language because they use symbols for communicating. This happens, you have to imagine, in the darkness of the hive, you can't see anything. And um, you, it's not a, a language that uses sound as the principal mode of communication, but movements. That's why it's called a dance language. So what happens is that a bee that has discovered a food source, let's say four kilometers southwest, can come back to the hive and tell other bees to fly four kilometers southwest without taking them there, without guiding them or leading them, but by giving them this information inside the darkness of the hive. And so that's unique anywhere in the animal kingdom. Primates, no matter how smart they be, they, they might be, they cannot actually, by talking or by um, giving such instructions to others, tell conspecifics or group members where food is. They can lead them there physically. They can be followed by other uninformed individuals, but you can't, they can't do this via um, communicating with symbols. The way this works in honeybees is that the um, the bee that has discovered the food source returns to the hive and you have to remember that the, the honeycomb is vertical so everything takes place on vertical surfaces and the bee runs around in a very peculiar roughly figure eight shaped pattern and the the one thing that's different from the, the figure eight is that the central um, where the lines cross over there is actually a sort of extended line along which the bee runs. And this central extended line is the most important component of the dance. So she runs along that line for a few seconds, then makes a circle to the right, runs the same line again, circle to the left, same line again, circle to the right, same line again, and so on. The duration of that central line, how many seconds she runs along that, tells other bees how far the food is. So let's say she runs three seconds straight, that tells other bees approximately fly three kilometers, right? Four seconds of straight line means fly four kilometers. Seven seconds, seven kilometers. So that's the code for the distance, but that wouldn't be very useful if you weren't also told the direction in which to fly. And the direction code is, is really something fantastic. So the direction, is measured inside the darkness of the hive on the vertical comb as the direction relative to gravity of that straight line run. And so this is how it's coded. If that run is straight up in the darkness of the hive, that tells other bees that follow this dancing bee, fly in the direction of the sun. So up means fly to the sun. If the line is straight down, that tells the other bees fly opposite the sun. And they also have the distance, so they will say, okay, three kilometers opposite the sun in this case. Any angle in between tells the other bees that angle towards the sun. So let's say inside the darkness of the hive, 45 degrees to the right of the direction of gravity informs other bees fly 45 degrees to the right of the sun. So they have to measure inside the hive the direction of the, the waggle run, as it's called, the straight line, which they use to gravity, memorize it, then once you're outside, decode it as being the direction relative to the sun rather than to gravity. So it's it still blows my mind thinking about it, but it's it, it an amazing does. communication system. It does, yeah. So, is but is it only in the social bees, or it's also present in solitary bees? It is not present in solitary bees. I guess for the simple reason that there is nothing for them to communicate about. They, if they did give away the locations where they're finding their food, they'd be inviting their competitors, and so that's an unfavorable scenario. You don't want to. Um, invite everyone around to share the same limited resources. So it, this particular 
mode of communication exists only in the honeybees. There's more than one species. So in addition to the familiar European hive bee, there is about a dozen um, species in the Asian tropics that differ subtly in their biology and their nesting architecture and so on, but they all have the dance language. They all have this symbolic code to communicate about food locations. But uh, these solitary bees, they do collect honey or the nectar uh, from the flowers, right? Or yeah, they have in many ways the same lifestyle. So they have a nest where they raise their brood and the structure of a nest can differ tremendously between species. Some use abundant snail shells, others nest in holes in walls. Um, some use clay for building little um, pots, others use leaves to seal off nest chambers and so on. But they all provision for their, their brood with um, pollen and um, uh, as a protein source and nectar as a, as a source of carbohydrates. And um, so that part of the biology is similar as are the demands on spatial memory. You have to remember where your nest is. But yes, so in these solitary bees, of course, there's no need to coordinate with other members of your colony. So you're a single household, so to speak, you do your own thing. Yeah, I was wondering if there are species in bees that they are carnivores, like their ancestors, as in wasps. Are there any examples? There are um, rare ones, but um, as you say, the, the, the bees, the familiar ones at least, strike us as um, likable insects because of their vegan lifestyle. They never um, seem to... Um, attack um, actively or kill other um, animals as opposed to wasps, which um, are often despised because they share our, our interest in ice cream and, uh, and uh, our, our barbecues in late summer evenings and so on. Um, but bees are related to wasps. And as you say, actually they stem from wasps. Bees ancestors were carnivorous wasps. Um, it's just that at some point along the way, bees switched to this um, vegan lifestyle, but there are a few reversions. Um, even in bees where the, one might not expect this. So for example, in the bumblebees that we often study late in the colony development, there is often a phase when, when the queen becomes a bit senile and, uh, and the, um, some workers are are very strong and they actually compete for the privilege of egg laying. And in such scenarios, sometimes the, the queen then eats the eggs of, the, of, um, of laid by another worker and vice versa. So they will eat each other's eggs. But in um, the neotropical, neotropics, there are also bees that, for example, specialize in um, eating carrion. So they will, they will actually um, get their protein from decaying food, and they sometimes also switch to live prey. So they have given up on this uh, uh, lifestyle flower visitation and have turned to, to meat sources again. So evolution is full of all kinds of uh, wondrous paths. Yeah, exciting. Um, but once we think of social bees, uh, especially the um, honey bees. Um, let's talk about their social structure. So how, how does it happen? Like as you, you said, there is one queen and uh, thousands of workers, but is, is it the only classification or there are like also we see classification in workers, for example? Yeah, so the, the social organization is interesting because the term queen, for example, seems to imply that there is a ruler, that there is one individual that has power and gives orders and somehow coordinates the efforts of the hive and perhaps masterminds the defense and, uh, and so on. That's not at all the case. So the entire structure is largely of the social system is, is largely decentralized. It's composed of thousands of individuals that each to some extent do their own thing, although for 
the good of the colony mostly. But but yeah, there is no the organization does not happen by anyone coordinating these efforts or or even directing a subset of bees towards a certain task. But within the workers, there are lots of specialists and specializations. I'd already mentioned the temporal sequence of specializations through which the bees typically go. So they start in honeybees by typically within hive duties, which include cleaning. So you need to clean debris and you need to make sure that the cells in which honey is stored or, or um, larvae are to be raised are meticulously cleaned. Um, someone needs to build the comb and young bees do that too. So they're engaged in construction work and, and um, also building fortifications of the comb so it doesn't break off anywhere. Um, there are undertaker bees. There are individuals that will actually, that are largely specialized in removing corpses from the colony. There are um, bees that are largely busy with grooming and looking after the queen, cleaning her and grooming her and, and so on. And they're also passing on pheromones from the queen to the rest of the colony. And then, of course, some individuals are busy as guard bees. They're um, sitting near the hive entrance and they're smelling anyone who comes in to see if it's actually a, uh, a member of the in-group or whether it's an intruder that could be either of a different species, like a wasp or a bumblebee. They do sometimes sneak into honeybee colonies to, to steal the honey. Um, but it could also be honeybees from different hives. They also sometimes rob each other. So they're, they're, um, they are opportunistic that way. They don't necessarily care or want to work hard for their honey if it can be had cheaper. And so sometimes there are raids from neighboring colonies or even further afield ones to um, try to overwhelm a colony and steal most of the, the harvest that they've made. And so um, yeah, there are multiple specializations. And how does it work that each individual finds its task? So it seems that again, rather than this being coordinated top down, it's rather a bottom up kind of scenario where, for example, the stimuli that tell bees that there is a certain need, let's say there is a call for hunger from the larvae or, or, or a signal that they, they, they need food, then some individuals of the adult worker bees are more sensitive to that stimulus than others. And so they will respond to this call first. Then if the, the need is not addressed and the, the hunger signal raises yet further, then more individuals will engage with the task until the feedback loop indicates that, okay, there is now a lower need, so okay, we can switch to other things again. And so it's with other stimuli as well. So one important signal in the hive that can be cause for alarm is, is raised levels of CO2, because that means that we might be short of oxygen. There is a, a need for, for um, more ventilation. And some bees are highly sensitive. So all bees can smell the can smell CO2, which we can't. So that's another sensory um, superhero ability that, that bees have and we don't. And it's it's just funny to think how might something like this smell? We we experience a smell as something pleasant or unpleasant. How does CO2 smell? We can't smell it at all, but they can. And um so some individuals are more sensitive to that stimulus and will start fanning first. And if that's not enough, and let's say it's really hot, and um, perhaps the, the opening of the hive isn't that large, so CO2 levels increase further, then simply the threshold, sensitivity threshold for more individuals will be reached. And they will then also start fanning until you've just got the right number to keep the CO2 levels low enough. But so again, there's no central organization. It's just individuals respond differently 
because they're differentially sensitive to the stimuli that indicate a certain need to do something. So I have done few conversations on nature nurture, and this is where you know the point comes. So I always take this examples of um, three social insects: uh, bees, ants, and termites. So all of them they have the same genetic material, right? Well, starting from queen to all the workers, like all the different workers that you just explained, and still they can manage to have all these different kind of sort of work attitude and also personalities, which we'll also talk a little bit more uh, later. Um, how is that possible? Yeah, so just to explain that slightly more. So um, the starting from the same genes, you're right, you can, you can manufacture either a worker or a queen. It only depends on the environment. Now, that does not necessarily mean that all the individuals in a colony are genetically identical. There is variation. Um, there, so um, in the same way as, of course, there is some variation between the siblings of a human family. They start out um, having some similar genes from their parents, but not all of them are shared between siblings. They are more related, workers of a bee colony are more related to each other than human siblings, um, but they're not genetically identical. But nonetheless, each egg that a queen lays, each fertilized egg can turn either into a worker in later life or a queen. And, and that is, the differences are dramatic. Of course, a queen is the size of a hornet. She's much larger. She lives many times longer than a worker bee. Worker bees only live as adults for a few weeks, whereas a queen can live up to seven years. Um, and the, the morphology is different. So the um, queens lack, for example, the apparatus for collecting pollen that I've mentioned earlier. So Workers have hairy structures which facilitate the harvesting and the collection of pollen. Queens lack them. A queen's, a worker's stinger is barbed. So if she stings you, her sting stays behind in your skin. Um, and the worker subsequently dies. Whereas a queen, in theory, can sting you multiple times because she has a very smooth dagger, but um, doesn't actually rip out when the queen attacks someone or something. Um, a queen's sensory apparatus is different. So she has smaller eyes, she has much fewer olfactory receptors on the antenna than a worker does and so on. So lots of sensory difference, lots of morphological differences. And of course, the biggest difference is that the queen lays eggs of up to a few thousand a day and workers normally do not do that. And a queen can do that for, for years and years. And as big as all of these differences are, the remarkable thing is that they come about not by genetic differences, but entirely by the environment. So there's nurture. And in this case, it's literally nurturing because it's that the queens in the larval stage, when they're little helpless white grubs in a in a wax construction, they just get different food from the workers. The queens get fed a special diet called gelée royale, and you can imagine that there are all kinds of folkloristic myths because in, in bees, very obviously, the, this uh, magical substance prolongs the life by a factor <laughs> of um, um, several dozen, and, um, and of course, humans are as ever keen to extend their, their short lives. And, um, and so there are, of course, all kinds of urban myths about Gilet Royale having a beneficial effect on human lifespan, but to my knowledge, that actually hasn't been proven. So we need, we'd need a different magical substance, presumably. 
but um, so yeah, the entire difference is is in the diet that these two types of individuals, queens versus workers, are fed, and people have tested that in that they've uh, simply moved eggs from worker cells into queen cells and vice versa. And sure enough, if you do that early enough, you can actually change the fate of an individual into either becoming a queen instead of a worker or vice versa. So there is a case where, if anywhere in biology, a strong case for um, the importance of the environment or nurture, then, then that's, that, that is a be really convincing example. Yeah, definitely. So the fate is decided at the egg. It's not decided at the egg level. It's decided later after they hatch. Yes and no. So in, in a bee's natural biology, it's practically decided as at the egg level because um, it depends on where the egg is placed. If the egg is placed in a worker-sized cell, then workers that feed the, the um, larvae that hatches from that egg will know, uh -huh, okay, this thing is destined to be a worker. We're not, we're giving it the regular economy food. Um, and the egg that happens to be in a queen cell, the workers will know, okay, this, um, this, uh, this individual will give, be given business class food. So it's only human experimenters that when they swap these eggs around, you, you can demonstrate that the decision is actually made later in the natural honeybees biology. Once the egg is laid in either the one or the other container, fate is already determined. So does it change once the eggs are switched? Yes. Yeah. So if you, if you remove an egg from a queen cell, put it into a worker cell, which means that the, um, that the, that individual will only be fed the, the basic version of the food. It will be a worker and vice versa. If you remove an egg from a worker cell, put it into a queen cell, the workers will go, uh huh. That individual must be fed the good stuff, and so it turns into a queen. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So, from the evolutionary point of view, of course, this is again. It, I remember reading it in uh, Richard Dawkins's book that there is this uh, arm race between queen and the workers because I mean, of course. Um, collectively you want to balance out things that you don't want to have more number of queens but also like at the worker level you want to balance out uh, certain things right like you don't want to have uh, how to say more workers but like at the end you want to have more workers right like how does this balance works well so i mean ultimately what you want to generate as a colony is to propagate your genes, so to speak. So the colony's fitness in that way is measured into how many individuals are produced that can ultimately carry new genes forward into the next generation. And so while the workers themselves are typically sterile, so they don't mate and therefore don't produce any um, any offspring, they do contribute to the overall fitness of the colony because the more workers you have, the better defended your colony is, and also the more food you can harvest. And if you can harvest more food, you can make more drones, which are male bees that mate, and also more queens that um, could generate swarms and then um, in that way, propagate the, the colony and the colony's gene pool as well. And this part is interesting, like the making of the queen. So once it's decided that one individual will become a queen, so then queen flies, and this is like the only flight she takes, or there are more flights there in the future. Um, so this flight, the first flight is to mate, right? And that's like the... Uh, I don't know how, I think in the book you mentioned there are like at least maximum 12 number of uh, uh, drones that it can mate with. But then uh, is it the only flight or there are more flights after that? There are very few flights in a queen's life. Um, so you're right, it, it starts, well, the first thing a queen does is that after she's hatched, she will often try to 
kill all or most of her competitors. So if the hive raises multiple queens, then um, then she goes around and stings the other ones to death. So to the extent that she can find them, she doesn't always succeed, but often this happens. And then she goes on these um, mating flights. There, are, there might be a string of them, but they happen in a very short period over a few days where she mates with, yeah, up to several dozen um, male honeybees. And then the, the sperm that she's obtained in these matings has to last a lifetime. This is also not trivial. If you think of, um, I mean, in, um, we humans conserve sperm for, for um, later usage um, in, in some cases where you have sperm donors and so on. But to keep it um, at the right kind of temperature and so on, so it doesn't either decay or um, or become otherwise useless, is has been a, a quite an a, well quite a bit of trial and error and engineering feat. Um, but bees do it all the time. So this sperm that's ob obtained in the first few active days of the queen has to last for multiple years, and. Then after she's completed these mating flights, she then basically becomes a cave animal and does not leave the hive for another year, at least. The, the only circumstances that she'll ever leave it again is during swarming. And swarming is something slightly peculiar in bees, if we haven't already heard a lot of peculiar things, but um, <laughs> many animals, of course, the the individuals to leave the native nest or um, or home or, or territory are the juveniles. The adults stay, the juveniles disperse. In honeybees, it's the other way around. It's the, it's the old queen with a good number of experienced workers that leaves the hive and she seeds it to the new queen. And so what happens there is that the, the old queen leaves the nest with a few 10,000 workers. They form a so-called swarm cluster on a nearby tree. Then they have to find a new location and agree on a new location. I can talk you through that in a moment if you're interested, but there is a very complicated form of consensus building where initially there's lots of disagreement and ultimately after a few days, they might have reached an agreement. And then they fly to a new destination, build a new comb construction and so on, but the queen then after this adventure reverts again to be being a cave animal for at least another year until again if she has daughter queens that um, take over the colony she will then once again leave the hive with a swarm and resettle again, but that only happens once a year and other than that she spends her days inside the hive laying eggs and no more flight activity. But unlike, for example, ant queens, she re retains her wings for this purpose because they might be needed once a year. In, in ants, they're not, so they just chuck them once they're mated and have, a, have a established a home base. Yeah, that's the interesting part, that in ants, once the mating happens, it's just like the queen turns into this factory of producing eggs. Right. I mean, it's the same, uh, of course, in the case of bees, but at least bees or the queen bee can fly a few more times yep. uh, before mm -hmm. before that happens. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the, uh, the, the nest is, itself. Now, of course, I mean, with all the coordination, we see this magnificent structure. I mean, we uh, once we look at it, uh, we see those wells perfectly hexagonal shaped. Um, and you do talk about uh, their importance, why mathematically they make sense. Um, so why do they make sense and um, how they are important in storing honey, for example? Yeah, you're right. I mean, first of all, it's a, it's a visibly magnificent structure. If, if you compare it to other things animals also build, like let's say birds' nests, and so on. They seem comparatively messy and um, and not not necessarily impressive in their regularity and symmetry and so on. Honeycomb is perfect. It's one exactly same sized hexagonal cell after another, 
of course, they also interface perfectly with each other because one walls, one cell's outer walls are the next cell's inner walls, so to speak. And so there's perfect interfacing and it's also two-sided, right? So it's, it's a vertical structure and there's cells on both sides whose cone-shaped, well, pyramidal-shaped bases also interface on both sides. And of course, this hexagonal shape is much better than say a, a round shape. So the round shape of course might be good to be adapted to a larvae's shape and so on. But if you had lots of round celled shapes, um, there would be gaps between them. And that's exactly what happens in bumblebees. So there's quite a bit of wastage of space and material. Whereas in honeybees, that of course is minimized just because there are no gaps between these cells at all. And so this has been fascinating for naturalists and mathematicians for centuries. And it was quite early that indeed people pointed out that this structure is pretty much mathematically optimal in terms of maximizing space use and storage space while minimizing material invested into the structure. Yeah, definitely. Um, and the 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 fact that uh, they can coordinate so well uh, to produce this structure that's also uh, interesting. And one of the experiments that I remember that also you discuss in the book is the is the fact that they the of course the the usual structure is starting from top from uh, from top to bottom. So uh, that's the like the usual way to do it. Of course, slightly at certain angle. But then this uh, we can control somehow, and that shows their plasticity of the communication. That you know, if we kind of uh, modulate uh, the way they uh, the way they go to make this hive, um, it will show up that okay, you know, the the they are not like those kind of micro bots doing certain thing. I mean, I remember listening to uh, Daniel Dennett who talks about he generally talks about this termite castle. Uh, and uh, kind of referring these insects to the, those microbots working together and making kind of this intelligent design or this design. But that's not the case, right? Like there is this plasticity when uh, it comes to bees, but I, I'm sure that it will be the case for other insects as well. Indeed. So I, um, I'd like to take Dan Dennett up on this challenge and show me the, the, the microbot that can actually deliver such a task, mm -hmm. including all the degrees of freedom and plasticity that you actually find in bees. So the experiment that you might remember there is one by a Swiss naturalist, Francois Hubert, who was actually, it was a very modern way of um, exploring this question of plasticity. So he was first of all interested in just seeing what happens inside a beehive. So, and so one way of going about that, of course, was because normally it's a wooden box or some other materials, but it's dark. And so he used glass walls and ceilings to see what would go on inside the hive. And the first thing that he discovered was that when he had a glass ceiling, the bees didn't like to attach their comb construction to the slippery surface. So the normal way for bees to go about this is start at the top, as you said, and gradually work their way down with the ongoing comb construction along the direction of gravity. And now the bees couldn't do that. So what did they do? And it turned out that in this case, the bees started at the bottom and built their comb upwards like a tower construction. And at first glance, you might say, well, that's still a sort of repetitive and robot-like process. But if you'd actually built a robot to just mimic what happens in nature, that robot would fail with this simple challenge of starting at the bottom and growing the, the, the comb construction upwards, unless you'd actually told the robot if starting at the top doesn't work, start at the bottom and reverse the construction relative to gravity. So you'd have to tell your robot that it couldn't just naturally come up with it. But the best experiment to my mind was when Hubert then said, okay, now what happens if I have a glass ceiling and a glass floor? 
In that case, the bees just started on one of the side walls and built their construction laterally through the cavity. And when the experimenters saw that, they, they said, okay, well, if that's not difficult enough for you guys, for you bees, we'll also put a glass wall into the path of the ongoing construction on the opposite wall. And in that case, what the bees did was turn the entire construction 90 degrees and attached it to the nearest wood wall. And I'd like to see Dan Dennett's little <laughs> robots here, because and again, unless you actually program them to, um, to cope with these several challenges in the way that the bees do, the robots would fail. And that's the key difference. There is a plasticity there in the construction abilities of the bees that to my mind is not yet apparent in, in any robot that hasn't been told to solve all of these tasks. So he generally uses this uh, reference, for example, that um, of course, all of them, when they come, they can make this kind of nice, uh, you know, design structure. But um, if we ask single B, that single B doesn't know like what it is doing. So he uses in that reference that, for example, our one neuron won't do, won't know what is it doing. But it's like all the neurons once they come together, they they give us this kind of uh, ability to perceive the world, etc. In bees, he might just happen to be correct that um, a single honeybee won't attempt to build a honeycomb. Um, there are species of wasps that have hexagonal cells and where a single foundress starts that construction. And she manufactures an entire hexagonal cell, starts with one, in this case, not from wax, but from paper. So basically um, tree bark that she's um, um, chewed up. Um, and then builds the next cell to attach it and so on. So in that case, it's one individual doing starting the entire construction. So that also exists at least somewhere in nature. Yeah, so since we are entering in the in the easiest part because before it was a bit difficult. Um, so let's let's talk about the uh, the psychological and cognitive abilities of the bees. So, First thing is simply the intelligence and cognition. I think the uh, it it has been a debate. I mean about the animals uh, first. I mean before it was like simply with the primates itself. Now, uh, of course, with more and more data, we are pushing that boundary. And now we are at the insect level. Of course, the other people who are working on uh, uh, cephalopods and stuff they will they will say even those guys they are uh, conscious and sentient um, so what's your understanding about uh, cognition and intelligence of bees yeah you're you're right to raise that point so of course it had been known for a long time that bees can learn and it's implicit in all these historic studies about learning flower colors and shapes and scents and so on, and also spatial learning. The abilities that we'd referred to earlier were al already quite well established. But when I talked at conferences or also in my department here, two colleagues working on primates and uh, let's say corvid birds, so classical iconic models of animal intelligence, they would always be a bit dismissive and say, well, okay, yes, we buy that bees can learn colors, but they, they have to do that because they visit flowers. So they become pre-programmed to learn certain things, but they weren't that impressed. And they say, we, we primate researchers, we deliberately face our animals with challenges that we, they do not actually encounter in their natural lives to test just how flexible they are with, um, with um, the, uh, such learning abilities. And so one such experiment that one of my colleagues was doing at the time was a string pulling task, where in this case, some parrots had to pull on a string to gain access to a reward. And I just um, jokingly said in a, 
meeting. Well, I bet our bees can do that as well. And everyone chuckled and thought, okay, now Lars has gone completely mad. But um, <laughs> but we we thought we'd actually give this a try. And so what we did in that experiment was we placed a an artificial flower, basically a, a round disc with a little well in the center um, under a plexiglass screen. And the, the bees had to, in order to get to the sugar water in the center of the flower, had to pull on a string that was attached to it and get it out from under the plexiglass screen. So they could see these flowers, but they could not actually get to the nectar unless they actually pulled the string. And they could learn that just fine. And so that surprised many people a little bit because that isn't an obvious thing that, that a bee ever has to do in its natural life, to pull on something to, to get a reward. But not only that, they could also learn this technique by observing other skilled individuals. And because all our bees are numbered, so we have little number tags attached to them, so we know which bee is which, we could see this technique spreading through the colony, like a, a social media meme, that you could see which individual came up with it first, you could see who learned it from whom, until basically all the individuals in the colony were, were capable string pullers. And so this technique, bees only live for a few weeks, so they, they eventually die with their skills, of course. But in, this, in, in some colonies, the technique actually continued spreading after the originally trained individual um, passed away. And so it was really like a, a culture-like process where a, so, a skill spread through an entire colony and then was retained for a long period. And that, I think, was quite remarkable. And to top that, we then did another experiment where um, we asked bees to roll a little ball over a horizontal area into a goal area. So in this case, now the object that needs to be manipulated is no longer somehow attached to the reward. It's a separate object. It's like us using a tool or a, a token in a vending machine. You have to take that thing and put it in a particular place, and only then do you get your reward. And they learned that too, to, to roll little balls. And of course, we had lots of uh, funny press about the, the, the bees soon out competing the, the English football team. But, um, <laughs> but the, 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 something else was actually more surprising than this for us. And that was the way in which observers, again, learned the technique from skilled demonstrators, as we call them, the individuals that had learned the task first. And in this case, we played a little trick on that transition. That is, there were three balls, each of them at different distances from the goal. Now, obviously, the clever way is to take the closest ball and roll that to the goal, right? But we played this trick that the experienced bees knew we can't roll these close balls because they're actually glued down. So that bee knew I have to roll the furthest ball and move that one to the center. And so she learned that and did that repeatedly. And this was also what she demonstrated to naive observer bees. So several times these naive observer bees saw an individual that, that picked the furthest ball and moved that to the center. And then we asked these naive individuals, all right, now you're on your own. How do you solve that task? And it turned out that rather than just aping the demonstrator, rather than just copying the actions and rolling the furthest ball, so I have to say that in this test, when the observer bee was on her own, the balls were, were movable, so they were no longer glued down. And then we asked, okay, now which, how do you solve this task? And it turned out that the observer bees picked the closest balls spontaneously. So they made an improvement, improvement on what they'd seen the demonstrator do rather than just copying the actions. And that indicates to us that there is some form of, yes, awareness of the desired end state of the task, of the, of the desirable outcome, which is 
have a ball in the goal area rather than just copying actions to get a reward. And that, I think, was mind-blowing when we first saw that. Um, I, I, I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw this happening in front of me. It certainly is. And it's great that you guys are also building new experiments because like over the years we have used, first of all, the same experiment, which was this mirror test that, you know, you if you want to test the intelligence, you show the mirror to uh, any species or the, the individual of that species. And, you know, you try to judge whether that individual can see the spot on the face and this and that, like they do a lot with the primates and uh, other species. But I remember that um, the uh, people working with elephants, for example, they laughed uh, on, on these experiments that because it's difficult for elephants to, uh, or I mean, they can recognize in the in the mirror, but they kind of then try to do other experiments. And one of the experiments was this rope experiment that I've seen. Uh, uh -huh. This was this was exciting there also. So this is exciting, like in a way that you guys are also building these new technologies, new experiments to test it out and see uh, how the how like they they do or how they perform in these activities. But the way I think is that so so for these activities, these actions to remember, they need also this me memory and metacognition and, and and stuff, right? So what's your comment on that? I mean, they it seems like they have good memory. I mean, if they remember this miles of uh, path to to go for foraging, to come back uh, to their nest, and then also to um, also to remember the landmark, etc. Um, and in 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 the last experiment that you describe about the position of the balls and stuff. So if they remember also the uh, the the position of the balls and how they were used. Um, and then finally, um, you know, the metacognition part, like processing it and deciding it, not just repeating the action, but deciding which action would make sense. So what's your comment on uh, the metacognition and uh, memory part? Yeah, so I think it's now uncontroversial that bees and other insects, in fact, probably all animals to some level, at some level have memory. And um, so while we might still think of lots of small animals as guided entirely by, by instinct and, and pre-programmed behavior that they can remember certain things, I think is now uncontroversial, even much simpler animals than, than our insects. Um, but, the question is what what can they remember and what can they do with their memories? So the memories are very long lasting in bees. So they last typically a lifetime, which at least in some honeybees, so I said earlier that they typically live only a few, for a few weeks, but um, honeybee workers in temperate habitats that overwinter, they actually live for several months. So they might forage late in autumn up until November, well, depending on how cold it gets, and then re-emerge in March when the first flowers come out and start foraging. And they still remember after these several months where they've gone before the winter break. So memory is certainly there and it's durable, but um, the interesting thing when you're exploring intelligence is what can you do with these memories? And, and the, the question then is, can you combine different memories to form new information? And that is, I think, where intelligence comes in. So um, I'll come back to the question of metacognition in, um, in a moment. But um, I'll give you an example, I think, that um, illustrates this, this um, combination of different memories. And this is a concept learning task where Martin Jurfa and his team have trained bees to learn the concept of sameness or difference. And so what the bees had to do in that case is they were shown a pattern, let's say a certain stripe pattern, and then um, after that um, pattern disappeared, they were then given a choice between that same pattern and a different pattern. 
right? And they had to recognize, aha, this one is the one I've just seen. But in the next trial, they were shown rather than patterns, they were now shown colors. So for example, the um, sample was yellow and the bee then had to decide out of a choice between yellow and blue, pick the same one that I've just seen earlier. And so in this case, she couldn't just get by with one memory of one stimulus because that stimulus was always different. Whenever the bee arrived at the setup, she found a new um, sample to memorize and then to decide between two new ones. So these bees had learned essentially the concept of sameness, choose the same ones, whatever you're shown. And the inverse was also possible that the bees learned a rule of choose the different one. So if I gave the, the or Martin's team gave the, the bees a blue sample and then gave them afterwards a blue and a yellow one to choose from, she flew to yellow because she learned take, take the different one to whatever you've just seen. Don't take the same one, but the different one. And so in that case, it's more than memory because memorizing just one thing doesn't help you. You have to rule, you have to learn the rule either to always pick the same ones or always pick the different ones. And that's intelligence. That's the kind of intelligence that already has been linked by some researchers at least as a, an indicator of a form of consciousness. So it's, I think wholly uncontroversial nowadays that there is good memory and in bees specifically for flowers, colors, their shapes, their location, their sense and so on. But intelligence is how you're juggling memories and how you can adapt different bits of information to form new information. Like for example, in the, the um, task with the ball rolling, okay, you have to remember I need to roll a ball to a certain target area. But these observer bees did more than that because they didn't just copy what they'd seen the observer do, they solved it differently. So there must be some form of mental exploration of what's the best way to solve this task rather than just remembering something I've seen somewhere else and copying it. So that's that's what we're we're astonished by. Metacognition specifically is is a kind of awareness of or a certainty about your own knowledge. So let's say you're um, you're um, in an exam and you might solve some tasks with ease and. Others you might also solve, but it takes you a bit of time and you go, oh, I'm not really sure about this particular one. Let's switch to another one that's easier first. And so that's a kind of awareness of your own knowledge. You're, you're sure about some bits of information, others you're not sure, otherwise others you might be sure that you don't know it. And so there is at least tentative evidence that bees have such metacognition as well from an experiment where bees when trained to discriminate pa visual patterns again rather than choosing right or wrong the bees were also given the option of just abandoning if they weren't sure and it turned out that the more similar and the more easy to confuse the patterns were that the bees had to memorize the more they went uh, I'm not quite sure about it, and, and uh, just flew away from the setup rather than making a choice which might result in this case in a penalty with bitter quinine solution. Yeah, and if we think of, um, or if we talk about consciousness, because that's the, I think the, the, the major gist of the, of the conversation here that are bees conscious then what like, what do you think about it? And what do people in, in the field now think about it? Well, that's your most difficult question, as I'm sure you're aware. And um, it is a difficult question, not just for bees, but for anything that isn't human. So you might have seen recent discussions in the media about whether certain artificial intelligence systems might be conscious, and if so, how would we know that? It's to some extent um, 
even a difficult question in non-language gifted humans. So up until the 90s, human babies were operated on with, without anesthesia in many cases because people thought they don't feel any pain. And they would concede, well, yes, of course they scream and kick, but that's just a reflex. They're, they're not actually aware of it. That's just stimulus response. You, you, you use a scalpel on them and then as a reflex, they're starting to scream. But they're not aware of anything they won't remember. And so we now view this as view as, as uh, absurd, but it just goes to show that diagnosing a living being or any kind of entity as conscious, it, th there is no single accepted experimental pathway or proof to make that call. So you have to use some common sense and analogy with humans that if certain abilities are related to consciousness or indicate conscious states in humans and also other animals, then by the same criteria, you also have to be able to judge new animals. Um, and so that's been the approach in that book where I guess a final-ish chapter is about that question. Could, given all we know now about bees, could we say that there is a form of consciousness? And so I'd already mentioned the ball rolling experiment, which in my view at least is needs some form of understanding of the desired outcome. It needs some form of mental exploration of and by mental exploration, I, I really mean instead of trial and error. So let's say the observing bee could try, after having seen what the demonstrator does, could try all kinds of things with that ball and eventually find out what is the way to get a reward. That's not what she does. She spontaneously engages in an action that is not a copy of what has been delivered earlier by the observer, but a new solution. And so this to me requires possibly at least some sort of exploration in the mind rather than physically exploring by trial and error. Now that's one test. And of course, um, for just one single test, everyone will say, well, okay, but, but there might be other explanations. Is there anything else? And that's the key question. I think that in, in exploring consciousness, we, because it's such a difficult question, because there's no certainty from one single experimental approach, we want lots of different ones. And if all these different lines of investigations come together, then I think you're nudging probability in the direction that in, indeed you are dealing with a conscious entity. And so there are some other things that I'd like to highlight here. So one, for example, is the recognition of shapes in different sensory modalities. So there are obviously simple ways in which you might memorize a shape or a pattern, and they do not necessarily involve you having a little virtual image of that shape floating around in your head. So you could, for example, memorize um, a a square or a circle just by by just memorizing certain edge orientations without actually have memorizing the image in its entirety and indeed people in my team who've done computer simulations about how little neuronal um, computation can you get by to still just so recognize a shape the numbers are often staggeringly small, just a handful of nerve cells, and you can recognize what looks like a complex pattern without actually memorizing the pattern as a whole, just certain elements of it. And so one way of asking whether there is actually an experience of a shape is to see whether it can be accessed from multiple different sensory modalities. And 
again to return to kids birthday party games so um one popular game at least when i was a kid was to to reach blindfolded into a bag and to recover a certain shape just by touching it without actually being able to see see it out of multiple other different shapes so you'd have to feel it and, ah, okay this feels like the key there it is and so in this case, when you can access this shape representation from different sensory modalities, there is at least, again, one indicator that it's a conscious experience, which um, you, can, you can use that flexibly. And the experiment we did was to train bees to recognize, to get reward next to balls, but they could not touch them, only see them. And then we gave them a choice between, let's say, balls and cubes in darkness, complete darkness, no light at all. They could now touch them, but not see them. And the bees that had previously experienced round things by seeing them as rewarding were able to locate the balls in complete darkness. And vice versa, bees that had learned to associate cubes with reward also found the cubes in the darkness more interesting than the balls which indicates to us that there is a kind of representation that you can actually think about and, and identify in completely different sensory modalities. So there is another line of investigation. So as I said, the more the merrier, the more lines of evidence that point in the same direction, the better. So in the book, there are some indicators also that bees experience simple emotions, optimism or pessimism-like states, which is um, regarded as, an, as evidence for sentience in at least other animals. You've mentioned the octopus, but also domestic animals are tested by similar paradigms. And we, we haven't done, nor anyone else to my knowledge, this uh, infamous mirror recognition, self-recognition test that you had mentioned in bees. But there is um, an interesting study by Shrida Ravi and colleagues that came out a few years ago, which is sort of related to self-recognition. And, uh, but it's a more biologically relevant task because bumblebees, unlike honeybees, are, uh, honeybees are all similarly sized unless they're queens versus workers, but workers roughly have the same size. In bumblebees, there are huge size differences. Some are almost as big as a queen. Um, so let's say three centimeters long and some are as small as a housefly. And so that means something for their flight through cluttered conditions. They have to be able to judge how big am I myself in comparison to this gap that I'm about to fly through. And what this team found is that apparently bees knew their own size before deciding whether to fly through a gap of a certain size and how to fly through it. Because if their own wingspan was too wide so that they'd risk colliding with the walls of a, of a gap between two objects, they would actually um, angle their body sideways and then fly through um, in, a, in, an, in, a, in a sort of oblique way to, to um, avoid injuring their wings. And again, this sort of awareness of one's own body dimensions and avoiding collisions in that way, in humans at least, is regarded as something that's, that's indicative of consciousness. So my, my take home message here is that there is no single proof from bees or any other thing but what we can do is try lots of different things. And if these all add up to a common picture of, um, of uh, pointing in the direction of consciousness, then this becomes very likely. And we would, um, again, in comparison to a robotic entity, we'd be hard pressed to find a machine that can already all do all of these things unless we've actually built it to replicate all of these abilities. But that's the key thing. So we could build a robot, or let's say we could have built a robot that does everything that was known bees could do 10 years ago. 
and and so yes, that bee could have learned colors and scents and uh, and landmarks and so on, but that robot would have failed completely at all the other things that I've told you about in the last fifteen minutes. That robot wouldn't have been able to pull strings or raw balls, um, and uh, and so on. And again, you could say, well, then I'll just program the robot to do that. And you could, yes, you could build a robot that could solve the string pulling task as our bees did. But my point simply is that it could only do that if instructed to do so by, by the engineer that programs the robot or the program. And that's the difference. So we haven't programmed our bees to do any of these things and yet they can do all of them so far. And even if we built a machine today that mimicked everything a bee could do, that robot or machine wouldn't be able to do what will be discovered next year or the year after by younger colleagues in the field. So that's the difference. I think there is an amazing plasticity to cope with novel challenges on all kinds of fronts in bees that indicates some sort of mental, internal problem solving, thinking about things that we don't yet, um, we're not yet able to implement that in machines. Yeah, and whatever you said, I think it's it can be applied easily to the uh, other insects and wasps, or what do you think? Remains to be tested. Um, and that's an interesting question also, because we have to be prepared that, let's say, our battery of tests, we won't only find animals that pass all of them. There have to be some that fail fails them. So where's the boundary? Where's the where does consciousness emerge? Does it is it basal in the insects? Does it apply to earthworms and so on. So there's going to be a boundary somewhere where an animal will fail these criteria. Within the insects, um, I suspect that many of the things we did with bees will work in wasps, for example. Um, we use bees, many of my colleagues use bees for, the, for sheer convenience, for the fact that they're relatively docile and easier to work with than than wasps, for example, but I have no reason to question that they would also work with wasps. Um, there are some biological differences, of course. What you will not find in wasps is something like the honeybee dance language, which is really unique to these um, this set of um, honeybee species. But um, in terms of the more general intelligence, I suspect that um, wasps are very smart as well. Yeah, I think the problem with the consciousness is that we don't know what is, you know, like, or how we can find those internal representations, what you were describing. Um, and this is where it will be difficult for us to, uh, until unless we find out a way to figure out, uh, because, I mean, we have been studying the anatomy of brain, we know, okay, which areas present in primates and, uh, you know, in other animals or insects, birds, etc. cetera. Um, so I think we are going at it. it uh, first of all, I mean, we have to go, go at it from the evolutionary point of view. That does make sense because no matter what consciousness is, it, it won't just uh, appear poof, like in few species or something. It will be, I think, out there. It can be some rudimentary version of it, but it, it will be out there in, in other species. The problem is that we can't really, or there is no way yet to figure out how those internal representations, they, they work. We don't really have, I think, the even uh, a good synthesis, good model for, uh, for it. Um, of course, we are looking for those neural correlates where we talk about, you know, the activity uh, at certain area in the brain that gives us this internal representation. And we are trying to find those modalities and how we can change uh, uh, those, those things. But again, until the time we have, we'll have that good theory to really, I think, pin it down that, okay, maybe this part, like, for example, I remember um, uh, Joseph Ledoux's work that he, uh -huh. he basically talked about amygdala, that it is the, it is the 
a part which is important for consciousness or I'm meeting him tomorrow so we can have a discussion then <laughs> oh that's great <laughs> yeah so uh, or mark soms he talks about uh, simply that it's the product of evolution and it is because of homeostasis homeostasis uh, and it it's it's a result of that so but i think overall the problem is that we just don't have the uh, that pinpoint um, at the center of the brain or like at any part of the brain which can say that okay this is important for the internal uh, representations right that's correct but we don't know that even in humans we we yeah. don't know the 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 actual circuitry that mediates consciousness where we know that certain areas in the brain are in certain states when we're conscious versus when we're sleeping or um, under general anesthesia but we don't know how it works but yet it's a phenomenon that uh, unquestionably is there and it's tremendously biologically useful and there are i mean yes the the the, the um holy grail in that research would be to find an, a neural correlate that could be then be identified across species or there might be various different solutions across species and so on but in the meantime i'm perfectly happy to contribute to the psychological or behavioral side of the body of evidence while others work on the on the the neural substrates yeah and it's equally important i think that uh, we need to also characterize from the psychological point of view and uh, i hope one day we'll find out the where is that barrier you know <laughs> so there are like philosophers that they talk about like life is the barrier i mean that's a barrier that once life starts there is but then again we don't know uh, how we will describe internal representations in for example a uh, single cellular species like in bacteria and stuff but then of course once we go to uh, multicellular then it's uh, another problem another thing where like uh, where it will happen in the complexity of these uh, different species so at the end i think yeah. we just uh, we we are stuck with that question how do we define how do we where do, where do we find this internal representations part yeah i mean i think that as a biologist i um hesitant to accept the notion that say plants might be conscious because i don't see what they would use it for in addition for there not being any evidence for it so the um i think some philosophers at least are overly generous with attributing consciousness uh, including to things like light switches or electrons and so on um i think we i mean it's it's a provocative way to think about the problem and it highlights that what we'd really like ideally is some sort of mechanism that that um that, that said okay a light switch clearly falls beneath that threshold but um but nonetheless i don't think there's any plausible argument in favor of either plant or light switch consciousness whereas i think there are at least some arguments in that direction in bees that could be made both from the utility as well as from the experimental evidence yeah definitely so i mean putting it all together uh, of course all the life forms they are important um, including bees and uh, bees are important for humans for of course the eco ecosystem in in many ways uh, you've explained it in the book you've explained it during the conversation they are great pollinators i mean especially or mainly we eat or our ancestors survived because of them right like this is also one thing that you mentioned in the book that we have this we managed to uh, maintain these bigger brains because of the sugars that we we could get from honeycombs is, is it correct that's a beautiful theory um it's not my theory but it's one that's been discussed in the literature and um the the evidence is patchy but interesting so the evidence is that first of all there is a very very long history of 
humans utilizing honey, and they didn't always in past millennia keep bees, but they would simply raid honeybee colonies for their sweet treats that were to be had within. And that's documented in many 10,000 year old or more cave drawings. Um, but now, of course, you can also do um, fancy chemical analyses of pottery and so on and find that um, for many, many thousands of years in prehistory, people were using honey and mead, so alcoholic drinks manufactured from honey, as well as also beeswax. But the history goes back plausibly quite um, uh, further into the past, because not just us humans, but all our um, large primate relatives also consume honey. And uh, chimps use tools, for example, to reach into to, um, honey um, or stingless bee colonies also to, to get the honey out and so on. So it's, it's a popular nutrition, not just with us, but with all our, um, with all our, our relatives. And before the advent of um, sweet shops around uh, in the corner um, store and so on, it was actually the most, um, the sweetest diet to be had anywhere in nature. Um, so before humans grew sugar cane and so on and, and made sweets industrially, this was a very precious treat to be, to be had. And we like sweets because they're pure energy basically. And so the, the rationale in this theory goes that honey and honeybees and uh, bee colonies that provided nutrition were available in the, in the um, range of distribution of early human evolution. And that this extra energy that it provided the humans who knew how to harvest it was crucial in admitting the, the evolution of their brains. But of course, without a time machine, that's um, difficult to reconstruct, but it's a beautiful theory, I think. Yeah, so, I mean, of course, if whether it's correct or not, but it, definitely there is uh, this importance of bees for the survival of humans. Uh, so what what are the next steps for, for example, bee conservation? I mean, I think it's, it's clear for uh, it's clear to humans that almost all the species which exist they are uh, affected by our presence. So uh, somehow uh, people are taking a lot of steps to like uh, kind of conserve them to maintain them. So what are the steps that you guys are taking? Yeah. So as you said, um, in the case of bees, the utility to humans is it's obvious. It's not actually to the provision of honey that we can live without nowadays, but through pollination services. So they pollinate our crops. So no bees, no tomatoes, no raspberries, um, and the list uh, is long. And um, so I think it's important to differentiate a bit because there is often a public perception um, fueled through incorrect media reports that the domesticated honeybee is under threat. The honeybee is not under threat anywhere in the world. Uh, it's a domesticated animal that's non-native in many parts of the world and it's well looked after by beekeepers. And so there's no threat to that species at all. It's the, the native bee species, the wild bee species that in many cases are under threat by, um, by habitat loss, by industrialized agriculture that um, gets rid of many of the flower resources that bees need as well as their nesting um, opportunities. But also, of course, the heavy use of pesticides everywhere in agriculture um, and so on. So there are multiple stressors, including diseases that are, have been spread by um, humans mostly and um, so many species of bees are at risk because of that and I think yes as you said many people are now aware that we need to do something about it. Um, what people can do in addition to governments hopefully banning more pesticides 
wishful thinking. <laughs> um, uh, what we can do as um, private persons is to provide more flower resources that bees require. And that can make a big difference because every human with access to even just a balcony and a flower box can provide some um, suitable flowers. It's important not just to use ornamental flowers, but those that actually um, feed bees. And you can probably buy seed mixes for such flowers in um, local shops. Um, if you have a garden, then of course you can plant more bee-friendly flowers and perhaps also some nesting opportunities um, to, to make sure that the bees have some places to, to solitary bees, for example, have places to build their nests. I think what I'd like to add to this growing awareness of the need to conserve bees because we humans need them is that with the growing evidence that they are probably sentient, there, there are other reasons to conserve them. And in the same way as we empathize with sort of iconic conservation animals like Siberian tigers or panda bears or, and so on, we, the reason we make efforts to conserve them is because we sympathize them. With them. We, we, we think that they understand and suffer from the deterioration of their habitats, from the difficulty of finding mates because their species are growing sparse and so on. So the prime motivator, there is not that panda bears are useful to us or Siberian tigers are useful for us, but it's because we empathize with them. And I'd like if people at least recognize that there is very likely something to empathize with a tiny mind, a simple mind, but nonetheless some sort of mind that deserves some respect. Um, and I have competent at, at the start of our discussion about the, the alienness of the bee mind. And yeah, you don't have to travel to outer space to find very strange minds with very different perceptions of the world, very different priorities, they're all around us most likely. And I think that um, puts on us an obligation to conserve the environments that uh, have shaped these strained minds. Yeah, I think that's a great message. And um, so one initiative that I liked was uh, what you guys did with the numbering of the bees and just leaving leaving, uh, leaving them out in, in London City so that people can see uh, bees visiting them in their gardens, etc. And uh, they can kind of see if once the bees are coming back, etc. I mean, I think it was good engagement for the, for the people. Uh, that was interesting. Indeed, it was quite a successful project and that we, so we marked several thousand individual bees of several species that all had their hives or nests um, on our university. And from their home bases, they then fanned out all over East London, visiting flowers as they saw fit. And people could observe these bees in their gardens not just as some sort of um, anonymous uh, entity drifting over the environment, but as individuals. They could see Red 36 coming back to their garden 10 times a day and for several days in a row. And so they recognize that this is an individual with a memory of that garden, with a preference for the clover flowers in that particular corner of the garden, and would come back there repeatedly, and people could verify that. Um, and at some point, of course, it was also gone because, yeah, bees' lives are short, and uh, some people were were quite sad when their their pet bee had disappeared from their garden. So it it gave people a different appreciation of what it means to be a bee and uh, how it actually is an individual with individual memories and preferences that um, was recognizable and distinguishable from others in the environment. Yeah, I mean, this was this was brilliant. Uh, that, that's what I, I thought. So um, at the end, what do you think? Because, I mean, I was thinking of all the work that you guys did and it's uh, that also you discuss in your book. Because 
what my feeling is that we are also like at least in the engineering perspective we are developing this artificial intelligence i mean of course it's not at at certain level yet but even if we match a level kind of like what bees have i mean that's why i think we need to study other species to understand what kind of range we can have for example this uv vision if we would have never uh, studied insects we will i think we won't understand that there are there are species that they can see uv and having a robot we we don't want a robot which will look like a human right we we want something uh from the engineering perspective which will uh be like a step further so having these kind of uh technologies which are already present on the planet and if we know about those technologies i think they can be easily incorporated in this higher uh machines so what's your uh, message to the the people who are uh, doing this kind of engineering thing if they they want to take messages from other insects or bees for example well there's already quite a bit of interest from the engineering work to leverage the remarkable navigational capacities of bees information processing for let's say unmanned aerial vehicles so there's a lot to be learned um not just in terms of the efficiency of the navigation and target recognition and so on but also from the energy efficiency so um one of the things are uh, about human supercomputers is that they're very human made supercomputers is that they're very energy hungry um and that's not the case with with um with brains of course with nervous systems in general i mean if you compare there's no supercomputer yet that can do anything as close to a human brain for example but um a human brain runs on a on a doner kebab basically um on a on a fairly basic meal and you don't need a lot of energy to do extremely intelligent things now if you look at the energy consumption of um the biggest supercomputers they fill factory halls and they draw huge amounts of energy now bee brains are even smaller a lot smaller than human brains and they run on a tiny drop of sugar water how do they do it how do they manage this energy efficiency while getting so much computation out of it um i mean i'm slightly it's it's always a two edged sword sword these um interactions between biologists and engineers and so on there are of course also ways in which you could um use the the knowledge in military ways so um we did a study now 15 years ago where we discovered that bees can be trained to recognize images of human faces and within weeks of the publication of that study i had this um person from the us military in my office and they were at the time inundated with funding to to hunt um um al qaeda um um kings and so on and um so he was interested in somehow using the principles of face recognition that the bees might use in some sort of a i don't know swarms of flying hand grenades or things like that um and it was a, a slightly scary encounter and uh, i um i i wasn't very ready to <laughs> engage in that cooperation i have to say yeah i mean that's always the case because humans can use the the technology in all the other ways but still um we have to be positive and we need to uh think that we will decide better for our future so um with that uh, thank you so much for uh taking time for this this was a great conversation and great book uh the the stories that you it's it's a perfect blend of the history and the uh discoveries all together that's that's the uh, amazing part so thank you, thank so, you much. so much yeah. thank you all right great thank you